What if I would tell you that you would never need to get lost again, unless you wanted to? And what if I would tell you that the next time you're at the airport and rushing to your connection flight, you could pull out your phone and it would actually tell you where to go to the gate? Or imagine I would tell you the next time you buy a piece of furniture, your phone could actually tell you whether it does or doesn't fit into your apartment. So if these things sound interesting to you, we need to talk. We need to talk about motion, we need to talk about space, and because we're at TEDx Zurich, we need to talk about Swiss chocolate. <laughs> and I think there is no contention about that Swiss chocolate is immensely important, yet let's return to this at a later point. And I first want to take you on a journey about why motion and space. So let's take a quick step back and look at what's happening while we're here uh, at TEDx Zurich and while you're listening to me. So every second, now, and now, and now. There are 5,000 tweets being published on Twitter. There is one hour of video material uploaded on YouTube every second. There are 10,000 images being shared on Instagram, as well as 41,000 shares on Facebook. This huge amount of information that we are producing every second is accessible to you just by a small device, measuring a few centimeters in width and height yet it's highly specialized to display text, videos, and images. It's actually tremendously good at this. If we think about it for a second, though, what's really important to us are other things. People, things, and places. 3D objects that just don't fit a 2D screen. And because mobile devices today don't have an understanding of space and motion, their understanding of the world around them ends at the boundaries of the screen. Yet, what is around us and where we are is fundamental to the way we humans interact, we speak, we talk, we communicate, and share information. And this is why we, and many other people in the field, believe that bringing a human-scale understanding of space and motion to mobile devices would actually enable a fully new way of thinking about 3D content and mobile. And all of a sudden, the device does not appear anymore as a barrier between these two worlds, but could actually be a bridge. So let's imagine for a second what that would mean if mobile devices would understand what's around us. They could, for instance, help you find your gate, as I've mentioned earlier. They could help you find good deals in a shopping mall. They could make sure that the couch you're buying actually does fit up the staircase to your living room, as well as show you best lines down a mountain bike trail, if you are into that. But beyond that, there is the huge area of virtual reality. And over the last couple of years, many companies have invested into headsets uh, such like this, where you can slot in your tablet and you can dive into a completely new world, experiencing digital playgrounds, visiting places that you have never been before, or understand the bigger picture. And I'm bringing this particular one up because tomorrow, the New York Times will ship 1.3 million of these devices to all their subscribers. And what they did, too, is that they made a video following three refugee children from eastern Ukraine, from Syria, and Sudan, three out of 30 million in total worldwide. And the video they made is a video where you can really dive into the situation. So you can put on one of these devices, and you can look around and really have an immersive experience. And this goes way beyond what journalism does today with text or images, or has been doing in the past. So this is important because it will help people understand better what's going on out there, just beyond their daily lives in the offices and at home. For mobile devices to understand these things, they need to be able to answer three questions that are super simple for us humans, yet tremendously hard for mobile devices, if not impossible. And they are, where am I, what is around me, and where am I going? Many of you say now, right, we have GPS, what's the deal? And the deal is that as soon as you move indoors, GPS doesn't work anymore, and we have to create new ways of finding where we are and where we want to go. And also, positioning might not be enough you might want to have the mobile device know what's around and how it's oriented in space. And to do so, we need to go beyond. But let's for a second look at where we are today. This is a video of me moving inside Zurich Central Station. And by only using GPS, you can see that we don't get far. On the right-hand side, you see uh, the maps overview of how the position is jumping around. And that's not good enough for many applications. And because that's not good, we have been working with ETH and Google on a project called Project Tango, which is about 
6D tracking, precise positioning tracking, and precise orientation tracking. What this really enables is this bridging between the two worlds, between the information in the internet and the real objects, because mobile devices now understand what's around them. There are three main ingredients to this. There is computational power, uh, there are sensors, as well as algorithms. The first one is simple, because all of you have today a mobile device in their pocket, and it's crazy, but it corresponds to a supercomputer 20 years ago. It has the same computational power for which you would have paid millions and millions of dollars just two decades ago. If we look at how we humans do this perception and sensing, we use our eyes and the initial sensing we have in our inner ear, and it tells us something about movement. That's what's making us feel sick. This wasn't possible for a long time in robotics, mainly because of this. In the 70s, when people flew to the moon, they used something called an inertial measurement unit, or short IMU, which corresponds to our initial, inertial sensing in the inner ear, but it was huge. Nowadays, it's much nicer. These devices are small, they only measure a few millimeters in width and height. If we integrate them into our devices, we get 30 images per second, and we get about 200 of these motion estimates every second. It amounts to about 9 million individual values which we need to process every second in order to do what we can do so effortlessly. It's not a problem for the mobile devices because we have this supercomputer power, but still, it just became available today. So in Project Tango, we build a set of devices, basically experimenting over shrinking sensors, shrinking compute, improving algorithms. And today, we actually have a device like this, which is uh, a tablet, has, these, uh, has a camera in there, has an initial measurement unit in it, actually like all your phones too. And it can do all these motion sensing uh, effortlessly. And we ship that a couple of thousand times to developers in order to build on top of a technology that we have developed. Back in 2013, when I joined the project, I was fortunate enough to join a very small group. It has, of course, grown uh, in the meantime, but it was super inspiring to uh, dive out of academia and to jump into a company as a visiting researcher for some time and take your esoteric research and plug it into a project and really try to make it work. It's quite different, actually, from sitting in a laboratory. So how does this all work? Let's imagine you have a picture of a building that some of you might know, and there is a user walking in front of the building following this yellow line, and she takes a picture with the smartphone from time to time. Things on the 3D building appear in the image. So there are corresponding 3D points on the building. We can do this over, so the user captures another picture, and we see that, again, we can observe this 3D point in our image, but now it has moved a little bit from the previous location. We do the same, we can observe the same. What's interesting about this is that if you make the assumption now that the building is stationary, all changes in the image must originate because of movement of camera and not because the building has moved, obviously. So, by doing so, and by combining this information with the inertial sensing from the IMU, we can actually apply this, uh, or put this into a mathematical formulation, which tells us where we are going. How is the camera moving through space? It's actually very similar to what you will do. So how does this work? On the left-hand side, you see the image of one of our cameras. On the right-hand side, you see the trajectory estimate. And I've started overlaying now some of these points that we track from frame to frame. We do many more than just a single one. What's amazing here is that even if I would fade out the image, we humans are also able to interpret the optical flow, how the image flows by our vision, in order to infer our motion. So many of you might say, now we have seen this before, this is old. And it's true, this has been around for some while. But making this ready for consumers is actually a major challenge. It, inquire, it requires a lot of testing, um, which we as PhD students anyway have to do as experiments. But it can be nice if you try to match it in a way that guarantees work-life balance by taking the devices out for mountain biking. So that was fun. What was actually nicer was trying these things in zero G. So we also went on some of these airplanes that do parabola flying. And by doing so, we could prepare for something that NASA wanted to do. They wanted to take our technology on board on the ISS, mount it on a small robot, and make the robot understand how it's traversing the space station. And that's interesting because now people from the ground can actually control the robot in a much easier way without requiring the astronauts to help them. We also wanted to know how robust it is for any end consumer. 
And there is nothing more extreme, probably, what we can do as non-jet pilots than sitting in a roller coaster. So also here, the system is doing actually a pretty amazing job in estimating the trajectory of how the device is moving through 3D space. Much better, probably, than most of us could do. It's also nice because you can take the trajectory afterwards, and if you have closed your eyes during the roller coaster, for whatever reason, you can tell uh, your friend afterwards how exactly it was and which curve you liked most. <laughs> Coming back to, to mountain biking, this is a video that my colleague Michael uh, from ETH recorded just about a week ago, where he goes down Utliberg here in Zurich, and he tries to break our algorithms. He doesn't manage, but it's impressive how you can see that we can track precisely the motion of the device without using uh, GPS information. And GPS actually also has some problems in forests because you can't have direct sight to the satellites. So this tells us a little bit about where we're going, but what about the question of where we are? Let's go back to the previous example where we have a set of images. We have found out in the meantime where these were taken because we applied the previous techniques. We still also have the motion estimates. We also know that we can track a point from image to image, so we know where a certain point has appeared in every image that corresponds to a particular point on the building. We can apply something now which is called triangulation, which is basically a mathematical uh, equation that allows us to infer from these measurements in the image where a particular 3D point was. So you just do this, but not once, you do this many times. You do this hundreds and hundreds of times per image and over hundreds and hundreds of images, and you actually get a nice 3D model of the scene. So it's nice to look at. It's even understandable for us humans. What's really cool about it is that if somebody else comes by now, you can share that model with this person. You can say, I've been here, and I've left a secret message for you there. Somebody else comes by, pulls out their phone, she takes a picture, and now you associate points in the image, again, with 3D points in the point cloud, in the 3D model, which is just basically a bit of a fancy search. What this allows you is to infer where that picture was taken with respect to the 3D model. So now the old user that has captured the 3D model and the new user understand where they are relative to one another. So I can leave you a message and you can come by and when you are at the same point, you can see my message or you can see my content. Or I can enable something like indoor navigation. Let's look at that. This is Zurich Central Station again. We have in the meantime made a map of that building, so I went through once and we have captured uh, these 3D points that represent our map, and now we plug that into a mapping application. What you see now is that we get very precise information about where the user is moving indoors. So you see there's no jumping anymore, there's nothing. There's just very tiny movements for every step that we're taking forward. Imagine it's Swiss chocolate. Let's search for that. Let's go to Springly. So we get point-to-point -point navigation now, very much like you're used from outside. But we also get something which is an AR overlay because we know precisely where the user is looking. We can lead the user downstairs um, all the way through Shopville, which I find extremely confusing. <laughs> Other people too. Um, all the way to the shop that we have been searching for. So a remaining question, of course, is how can we build these 3D models? Like, do you all have to help me now? It would be great. Um, and that's actually what we're planning. So at ETH, what we did is we took a Bayes model that somebody has generated, and we take a set of students, or other people, with the same devices. And imagine now every user goes out and draws a small map on a piece of paper. Here we capture it digitally. And then there is this, this central entity that collects all this data that people have collected, all the small maps, much like OpenStreetMap, and assembles them like a puzzle into a large map that covers the entire central station. Using this technology that we have been working on at ETH, we can actually build fairly large models, and models that actually help you navigate, for instance, in Shopville. So people with our devices can now go there and get actually pretty reasonable indoor navigation where they can navigate around. There are also more fun things you can do with this. For instance, you can take a model in the forest, and you, somebody goes down and collects some data, for instance, imagine your friend, and she has, whatever, like, found a super nice trail down a hill that's very special, and she, she, it's, it's kind of secret, nobody else knows it. And you couldn't collect that data now and share it with a friend. And your friend loads that uh, on her smartphone, and you can follow the same trail now. You can exactly see how the other person has moved in the forest. You can follow that, you can share your experience about how that was. You can also compare velocities afterwards, if you're interested in that. 
So as a last thing, now, we know, now that we know where we are and where we're going, we need to understand what's around us. And to do so, we equipped our devices with a depth sensor, which instead of capturing color, seeing on the left, it captures depth and shape. Combining this with the motion estimates, we can now start building very detailed 3D models. So this is work of my colleague Ivan Dryanovsky. And what he's doing is he is building a 3D model in real time on the device. And by doing so, he can basically capture an entire apartment in a few minutes, which can then be very useful for real estate agents that want to show an apartment to clients, or for architects that want to modify or capture a floor plan where there is no floor plan available anymore. This is the same, actually, that you could use for measuring the couch before you buy it. It's still a bit rough, but these are things we are, we're working on. And remember, we are still researchers, so we take it to where it gets accepted at a conference. <laughs> so having these three pieces together um, in Project Tango and with all the researchers that were involved, we built something that starts to be able to answer the three questions of where we are, what's around us, and where we're going by implementing 3D tracking, localization, and the spatial awareness. And if we return to the previous example of the 2D content on the left and the 3D content that really matters on the right, now we start to understand how the device doesn't need to be a divider anymore, but it could actually be a bridge between these two areas and, and bring them together and build something new. And what we need now are people like you, people that are inspired and want to go beyond the state of the art and want to build something new on top of our technology, build apps, build games, build experiences. And we together can probably think about an entirely new way of having 3D content on mobile. And we need to rethink how to do this, or we need to rethink everything. Thank you. <laughs>